Hi, I'm Emily Ladau. I am a disability rights activist and author of the forthcoming book, Demystifying Disability, What to Know, What to Say, and How to Be an Ally. You can't see it right now on the screen, but I have a physical disability. I am a wheelchair user and was born with a disorder called Larson syndrome, which affects my joints and muscles. And so I like to joke that I am a quote, professional disabled person. Disability advocacy is my passion and my work around disability shapes everything that I do. Ableism is, to put it quite simply, attitudes that we hold and actions towards people with disabilities. But it's not only directed towards people with disabilities. It's any form of discrimination that's informed by the negative misperception that we hold about the value of someone as a disabled person. I really think it's so important to also recognize that Ableism doesn't exist in a vacuum. Ableism very much intersects with other types of discrimination, with racism, with sexism, homophobia, xenophobia. Ableism shows up in all those conversations. And that's actually important to recognize because disability is the only identity that can cut across any and all other identities. So when we're talking about ableism, we need to recognize that ableism doesn't just happen in relation to disability. It happens in relation to the intersections of other marginalized identities that people also hold. So for example, a person of color with a disability experiences significantly different types of ableism than I experience as someone who has the privilege of being a white woman with a disability. I often think that we don't even realize that we're being ableist towards other people because discriminatory mindsets towards disability are so ingrained in how we're taught to think and to operate in our daily lives. And so ableism can look as small as passing a judgment about what someone can or cannot do without actually communicating with that person in a way that's accessible to them about what it is that they can or cannot do. And it can be as big as completely excluding someone with a disability from, for example, a field trip. If you're planning a field trip and a student with a disability is unable to participate in part of that field trip, that's ableist, right? When it comes to understanding how ableism impacts people on a day-to-day -day basis, how it shows up in our daily lives, we need to understand that it can show up in very small ways, what's known as microaggressions, maybe making a judgmental comment towards someone such as, oh, you're smart for someone in a wheelchair, which is a comment that I've gotten a lot. But really, not only are you being ableist towards me, you're also being ableist towards people with intellectual disabilities by making a value judgment on someone's worth based on their cognitive abilities, right? And sometimes it's really big in the sense that we assume that a child cannot advocate for themselves, cannot be part of the conversation about adapting the classroom, adapting an activity to make it accessible to them. So evilism looks like so many different things. And it's really important that we recognize that within ourselves, we can combat that and we can work with the disability community to ensure that they're leading the conversations and they're leading the way. It's so important to recognize that a parent-teacher association isn't necessarily just about student inclusion. It's also about being inclusive of the parents and the teachers, recognizing that teachers can have disabilities, parents can have disabilities, 
asking how you can ensure that you are bringing everyone to the table. And also, in terms of being more inclusive and less ableist towards students, involving students in the conversation, although it's a parent-teacher association, you're talking about the students. And so often what happens for people with disabilities is that conversations are had without bringing people with disabilities to the table. So there is a motto that the disability community often says, nothing about us without us. And what that really means is that if there is a conversation Disabled people should be at the table. They should be part of that conversation. Whether it's a young student just learning how to take part in their own IEP meeting, or whether that's a parent who might not be able to drive back and forth to all of the PTA meetings that you have, finding ways to meaningfully bring people with disabilities into every conversation will only serve to make everything that your PTA does better, more effective, and more inclusive. The language of disability is so deeply personal. And the first thing that I always remind people is that we have to respect and understand those personal preferences. So you've probably heard me saying disabled person or person with a disability, even within this video. And I know that sometimes one or the other might give people pause and they might say, oh, I thought you weren't supposed to say disabled person or, oh, I have been taught to use what's known as person first language and to call someone a person with a disability. And the truth is that there's not a right answer necessarily because language is something that everybody comes to from a completely different perspective. So what I tend to advise, if you're not really sure what to say, it's okay to say person with a disability. The important thing here is not to be afraid of the term disability. It's really not negative or a source of shame. The reason that we feel like that is because we've ascribed that very negative meaning to disability. But what we need to do is turn that on its head and recognize that disability is an identity and a culture and part of what makes people who they are. And so in my case, I embrace that and I use what's known as identity first language and I say I'm a disabled person. And that's because I don't want the disability to be separate from who I am. I proudly identify as a disabled woman and I'm disabled in the same way that I am Jewish in the same way that I am female, right? They're part of who I am and what makes me a whole person. That being said, there are so many other terms that we use when we're talking about disability. There's special needs and there's differently abled and physically challenged, right? Especially in school systems, we often see a lot of ways to dance around the term disability. And I don't presume to tell anyone what they can or cannot use personally. But I also really recommend trying to embrace the word disability because special needs is not a legal term. It's not the Americans with Special Needs Act, right? It's the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so disability is something that can, if used as an identifier, open up the door to services, to accommodations, to a community, to support systems. Let's start shifting our mindsets away from being afraid of the term disability. But of course, also take the time to recognize what language students are gravitating towards. Because sometimes you'll see that a student begins to, after being exposed to different types of language and different terminology for disability, they'll start to indicate what their preference is. And above all else, respect that preference. Respect the language preferences of people with disabilities or disabled people. And in doing that, that's how you empower people to embrace their own identities. My best advice for parent leaders 
is to make sure that they're not advocating for people with disabilities, but with people with disabilities. I think that's such an incredibly important distinction. When we're doing things for or on behalf of someone, we're often not actually taking what they need and want into account. But when we're doing something with the disability community, that's how we actually are going to make a more inclusive and better school system for everybody.